Well, good morning. It is great to see you on this Thanksgiving week. Can you believe it? Already snuck up on us. So, we are glad you're here this morning. Uh, a couple things real quick, just so I don't forget and you don't look and go, what's going on? First of all, David and Michelle are with their family over for Thanksgiving, so he's doing much better, And because several people have asked me, so I wanted to go ahead and say that, and we miss him today. But Marsha, we're glad to have you filling in. I don't know where she went, but she's somewhere. Anyway, I can't see anybody now. Um, also, just so you know, when I'm walking around, if you see me make a face, my back, I hurt my back, which is nothing new, nothing exciting, but if you see me make a face, that's, that's why it's not your fault, Tracy. <laughs> Okay, maybe, maybe. It's probably Marty, but it could be Marty. But anyway, but we're glad to see you today. So today we're going to talk about determined faith, and I want to talk about this idea, and um, I hope you heard what I said to the kids. That's really for you too. That's kind of part of the sermon um, uh, that we're going to talk about today. But we're going to talk about determined faith, and I don't know if you've ever gotten to the point in life where you just feel like getting away from it all. You know, like the Southwest commercial, want to get away. And there's times in life where you, you just want to back away from people. And listen, there's a balance in that. And there's times that we need space and all that thing. But the truth is, the enemy wants you to give up. He doesn't want you to love people. In order to love people, there's sacrifice involved. And in order to love people, that means it's painful sometimes. Sometimes when you love people, the way they treat you is not good. They don't. Uh, uh, not only, sometimes uh, no good deed goes unpunished, you know, you've heard that. And yet sometimes in life there's this idea of persistence that we need. Now one of the stories, we're going to be looking in uh, uh, Luke chapter 17 and 18 today as we continue our series. By the way, if you didn't know, that video that plays, I decided to try something and have AI make the series thing. So if you'll notice, all of those little videos it goes through are totally messed up. Like, there's one with like six hands, and they spell words wrong and everything. So this was the final, after 200 times of trying with AI to make a thing, I got this one. But AI is thankfully not smart enough yet to do it. So this is kind of what we came up with finally. I'm sure... I have no, I, hopefully that's not a bad word up there on the right in a different language, but um, an ISO apparently is some type of technical thing that computer people nerds know, because a couple of computer nerds said, you know what that means? And I'm like, no, no, I don't. And no one else does either. So that's where that came from. Next week, we're starting a new series called Baby Shower, and we will go back. We started Luke a few chapters in and skipped the birth story, so we will go back. It's kind of the same series, but we'll go back and we'll talk about the story of Jesus' birth because, you know, it's Christmas time, so that's what we do. So when we went to visit uh, Jenna in Seattle, uh, one of the things we did is we went sightseeing. And so we went to this one road where you can see like ancient writings on the side of these mountains and these cliffs, and it's just really cool. Like, and there's like stick figures, and I've, I've, feel like I'm almost as artistic as somebody from thousands of years ago. Almost. Uh, my stick figures are much worse than theirs. Um, but as we went down the road, all of a sudden there's this whole group of people. And they had chalk on their hands, which coming from Miami, you kind of double take when you see people with white stuff on their hands, just so you know. <laughs> Explain to your children later. Anyway, so, um, and what they were doing, they were free climbing on these cliffs. It was crazy. There was no rope, nothing to catch them, and they were free climbing. And I thought about this later. I thought, what happens if you're halfway up and all of a sudden you're like, I'm tired of this. What do you do? Exactly. You cry. No. What do you do? You can't just let go. You can't just stop. You've got to what? persevere. And it's funny how in certain things we are good at persevering. I wasn't sure if that was my grandchild, but he's so far he's all right. All right. So there are certain things we persevere in. Some of you this week are going to persevere through dessert after you've eaten plenty of food. You're going <laughs> to persevere. I think, I think I can get a little bit more in. Some of you at some point this week will have leftover ice cream 
And you'll look and you'll say, you know, rather than get a bowl out, I think I can just persevere through the rest of this carton, right? How many of you have ever persevered through a carton? Okay, I'm just making sure I'm, these are my people here. So we're talking about gluttony. It is a sin, but we're not going to talk about that. All right. So, so persevering is the idea of holding on when things are tough. And so today I want to give you three thankful truths about faith. And we're going to talk about being thankful, talk about being grateful, talk about what God has done. And I hope in the middle of this, um, that'll also help you to just, just keep going. Sometimes you just have to keep going. Um, sometimes in life you don't have a good answer, you don't have a good response, you're just saying, God, I need your help to walk through this. And so we're going to hopefully give you some things. All right, number one, practice small but grateful faith. So Jesus kicks off, the, we kick off with Jesus in this chapter talking about forgiveness. And then it's funny, the disciples almost like change the channel on him, which I think is funny. Jesus is like talking about forgiveness, and then they're like, uh, increase our faith. So this is where we pick up in verse uh, 5 of Luke chapter 17. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. And if you've never seen a mustard, how many of you have ever seen a mustard seed? They make mustard seed necklaces, you can buy mustard seed, um, but it's basically the size of the head of a pen. And it becomes this huge tree, and it's this idea that we sometimes think we've got to pray just right. We have to have the just the right kind of faith. We have to, and what's neat about what Jesus says about children later on is the idea that you don't even understand everything. It's the idea of trusting God when it's hard, and, and just having that mustard seed, that small bit of faith. It's not about you. It's not about you having your act together. It's not about you knowing everything. It's about saying, God, I'm going to trust you. And then Jesus talks about being an unworthy servant. And then he goes on in verse 11 to pick up, we pick up this story. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now remember that the Samaritans were enemies to the Jews in many ways. It was, there was a civil war that occurred. They worshiped in different places. There was a lot of uh, uh, arguments and almost a political. The, when Jesus sat um, with, the, with the woman at the well, she tried to get into a political argument with him. And Jesus just kind of said, yeah, that doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, that's, he didn't say it that way, but... And so that's what was going on. The Samaritans, a lot of times, even very strict Jews would avoid Samaria. They'd walk around the city. They'd go out of their way. It'd, it'd be like uh, uh, needing to go to Mims and you say, but I'm not going through Titusville, which I actually have done that, I think. Just so, anyway, yeah. So, but that's the idea. You'd have to go around, right? So on his way to Jerusalem, they're traveling. As he was going into a village, listen to this. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, and called in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now, you have to understand, lepers, first of all, lepers lost a lot of feeling in their extremities. I talked to Kristen about this last night, and um, by the way, you can get it from armadillos in Florida. Did you know that? Just a random fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. Fun fact from the pastor and something you'll never forget. You won't remember anything I said in this sermon and you'll be like, you know, you could get leprosy from armadillos. Anyway, so, and what would happen is just like somebody with diabetes loses feelings in their extremity, they would step on something. Uh, maybe not a nail, but they would step on something and not know it. And then what would happen? They would lose a finger, lose a foot, lose part of their... And so, and so the lepers, their skin, everything, they looked terrible. And when a leper walked down the road, they would be covered many times, obviously for many reasons. But the other thing, they would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, as they walked down the road. How would your self-esteem be? If you had to yell unclean, I, you, do you remember being a teenager and on picture day you looked in the mirror and went, oh no, do you, how many remember, I remember that, right? And suddenly you had no acne and the day before pictures, all of a sudden the North Star, right? That was a, there's a commercial for Clearasil, anyway, Google it. Okay, so, right, and, and so all you could think about, you think that you're this huge, oh no, well, imagine having to walk down the street every day, and any time you came close to somebody, you had to yell, unclean, and they took off the other way. 
They tell, I mean, haven't you ever done this? <sighs> and thought, oh, I better be careful who I talk to today. Imagine if you're yelling, bad breath, bad breath, as you go down the street. Now, we do know some people that need to do that. But, uh, okay, that's... Right? And so they're yelling, unclean, unclean. And, the, and then, so somewhere along the way, they heard about Jesus. They heard that Jesus could heal them. Maybe people who brought them food. Um, we don't know if it was like the movie uh, Ten Commandments where they dropped the food down. Isn't that Ten Commandments? Where they dropped the food down and we don't know. But somehow they were able to talk to somebody who said, you should hear about this Jesus. He's healing people. He, he is making people whole. So all ten of the lepers, what do they say to Jesus? Help us. All of them, all of them, help us. We need your help. By the way, you ever been there where you say we need your help? Now, the story continues. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priest. What was he doing? He was going back to the Old Testament and, and the rules of cleanliness in the Old Testament where they had to show themselves to the priest. That was a way they showed that they no longer had leprosy. By the way, by the way, over the years, many times Jews did not get plagues that other people got in their society because they would sweep their house out, remember? They would get all the yeast out of their house so they wouldn't have rats and mice and rats come with ticks, and ticks come with all kind of plagues. And so there would be a community of people, and there'd be Jews in that community, and everybody else would get the plague except for the Jews. And then everybody else would go, huh, they didn't get the plague. I bet you they gave it to us. Doesn't that sound familiar, like something that's happened recently? I'm just throwing that out there. But, right? And so then they would persecute the Jews because they said, oh, they must have given it to us since they don't get it. Why did they not get it? Because of these cleanliness rules. So Jesus goes back to the Old Testament and says, go show yourself to priest. You know, show him that you no longer have it. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God, and I love this, in a loud voice. By the way, if you don't like loud noises, feel free to wear uh, hearing protection or cotton. But the truth is, heaven, over and over in Revelation, it says, and they, in a loud voice, in a loud voice, in a loud voice, which means that, I, Ricky, you and I are very spiritual. There's also a verse about loud voice in the morning, but we're not going there right now. All right. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then I love this. Side note, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Great band. <laughs> then, sorry. Touring the last time this year, right? Is that what, okay. Then, oh gosh. I really should have had more coffee. Or Ridlin. All right. Then he said to them, listen to this, rise and go, your faith has made you well. And I found out something I've never, because I read this and I'm like, wait, weren't they all healed? They were all healed, right? By the way, we love to think that we're the one, not the nine. But we're going to get honest in a minute, so buckle up for that one, okay? But here's the truth. This also means your faith has saved you. It literally means your faith has saved you. So everybody was healed, but this guy was saved. Why? Because he realized where salvation came from. So he came back to Jesus. He said, I said I needed you. You took care of me. I'm going to praise you. So let's be the one and not the nine. Here we go. This is how we do it. Do you remember that day that you thought you weren't going to survive something? Do you remember that day where you were praying, God, heal me from, or deal with, help my friend, or Lord, help me to walk through this? I've noticed today that all of you are still here. Maybe not mentally, but physically. So you've made it through something. So here's the question. Did you go back and thank God? Or did you start looking at the next problem and head for that. And I'll be honest with you, we're, we're so busy crossing speed bumps in our lives sometimes that we cross over one and we're already looking at the next one. Every once in a while, especially at Thanksgiving, we need to look back and say, God, thank you. Do you know when Thanksgiving really was established as a regular holiday? I mean, I know you know the pilgrims and all that stuff, but, but, be, but after that, it was established as a national holiday by Abraham Lincoln. 
Do you know what was going on during the time of Abraham Lincoln? If you lived in a town, once a week you would go into town and they would read all the names of your family members and relatives that were killed that week. Do you realize that? Do you realize how many people were dying all the time? And Abraham Lincoln says, give thanks. It's an important time to give thanks. Even Abraham Lincoln lost a child. It was tragic. His wife was probably not sane, by the way. I mean, before everything else happened. And yet, what did he say? There's a time to give thanks. I don't know what you're going through this year. I don't know what you're walking through, but I promise you, even if you're walking through 42 things, God's at least helped you through one. And so instead of looking at the other 41, say, thank you for this thing in my life you've walked me through. So that's your first challenge. Take time to be thankful daily. Take time to be thankful daily. Because we call out to Him when we're in need, but sometimes we forget to come back and thank Him for helping us to walk through it. And if you have teenagers and now they're not teenagers anymore, you really should give thanks because there were days that you thought, not only are they going to kill you, but you're going to have to kill them. Right? That's, sorry. That's, okay. You got a few years. Jim Gaffigan, he's got a new special where he talks about what something that happens when they turn 12. You, you'll have to watch it. It's really funny. I love what Joanna Gaines says. If you don't know who that is, Google it. It's up to us to choose contentment and thankfulness now and stop imagining that we have to have everything perfect before we'll be happy. Number two, so not only practice small and grateful faith, seek humble and repentant faith. Now, I was going to bring the little thing of breadcrumbs from our house, but I couldn't because my wife needed it today, and I wasn't going to get in trouble. <laughs> but yesterday, she said to me, hey, can you get the panko, is that how you pronounce it? The panko flakes out of the pantry. And I made a huge mistake. And I think it's because I watch a lot of Price is Right. And I said, you mean the Planko Flakes? She goes, Planko Flakes? Who calls them Planko Flakes? They're Panko Flakes. And I went, no, they're not. Which, by the way, I should have just given up right then and said, you're probably right, because I'm an idiot, and I know that. We know who's the smart one, and we know who can spell better. But for some reason, I have gone to the store with the list, with Panko on it, and thought, I'm getting Planko flakes. Planko, Planko, see? And I've put them in the cart. I've used them in recipes and called them Planko. I'm this dumb. And yet, I said to my wife, Panko? Oh, that didn't go over well. She went to the pantry, found the Planko flakes, and reminded me that there is no L. Huh. I am as dumb as you thought. That's great. And that's how pride works. We think we're a little better than other people. We think that we have our act together. Listen, we think, oh, I know about this one thing. And if we're not careful, we'll be the wrong person in this next story. Well, a lot of times we're the wrong person in the first story, but there's another one. Here we go. This is a comparison. To some who are confident of their own righteousness, I'm going to earn my way to God. By the way, every religion other than Christianity, you earn your way to God. Christianity is about God came to us and we need him and we surrender to him. That's the big difference between Christianity, real Christianity, and every other religion. Is I need God, I can't get there. And so it says, they were confident of their righteousness. They looked down on everyone else. Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Marianne, you ready? My tax collector friend. You have to realize, Jews had two categories of sinners. They did, absolutely. It was sinners. Sinners included 
murderers, adulterers, thieves, robbers, horrible people. But they had a separate category that was worse. Tax collectors. True, true. So you were a sinner or a tax collector. It was like you're a normal human or you're a politician. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, sinner or an insurance. Okay, okay, right? Don't go there. Everybody, whoa. All right, so sinners, all the big category, tax collectors. And so Jesus throws the tax collector in here. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I... I figure it's like Thurston Howell. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. <laughs> Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even, listen to this, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. What is he focused on? What I do, my works, my good works, my good works. But the tax collector, what did he do? Stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. By the way, this is why the Pharisees hated him. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I love to think that I'm the humble guy. And then I get in a car. And I'm driving in my car yesterday and I'm coming down a little back road and the speed limit's 35. And let me just say to all the officers out there, I'm driving 35. This is an exaggeration. And I look in the rearview mirror and there's a car behind me. And it looks very similar to a charger that I have seen with identifying marks on the sides. So I'm looking in the rearview mirror, I'm looking down, I'm looking in the rearview mirror, I'm looking down, I'm looking, and I'm like, I need grace. Lord, I need grace. Lord, I need grace. And then I realize it's not a police officer, and I went right back to the speed I was going a second before. But then, I'm then on 520, and I'm on 520, and I'm driving whatever speed I'm driving, which we're not going to talk about right now, and somebody comes up behind me, they've got to be going 100 I won't tell you how I know that, but it was much faster than I was going. So I, as quick as I could, got over, but it wasn't fast enough for them. They had to get as close as they could to show me that I shouldn't be passing when they're coming through. And I got over, and they passed me, and one second later, I looked, and in the median, median was an officer watching the guy go by, and the guy hit his brakes. And I went from thinking, God, I need mercy, to God, you need to apply justice right here. <laughs> Anybody else done this same? Okay. If you haven't done this in driving, you may have done it in some area of your life. Why? Because we all think we're the humble tax collector, but too often we're the arrogant Pharisee that thinks we're a little better than other people in this area or that area. And if we're honest, we just need to say, God, I don't even know me. God, I think I've got my act together. God, I think that I'm good in this. I'm the best driver on the road, Lord. I, you know that, right? If we're really honest in prayer, isn't that how we would pray? God, you know what a great driver I am. Right? You know what a great parent. You know what a great, right? But the truth is, he says what? Who's justified? The one who humbles himself says, God, even, as Paul says, even my best works are filthy rags. Confess any pride or self-promotion. You're going to be getting with other people at Thanksgiving. And guess what I've learned? When you get with family, by the way, Kristen has Italian family that's coming over today. So I have to say, when you get with family, none of them are like you. And it's easy to say, man, I can't believe they, and you fill in whatever blank you have. Lord, thank you that I'm not like. And if we're not careful... We're on the wrong side of this story and the first story. Let's see how we do on story number three. You ready? 
recall that you only need childlike faith. I remember when Kyle was little, and he would, and this is 30 years ago now, I'm getting old, he would come to me with a toy, and he'd say, Daddy, fix it. And one of the coolest things in the world is when I actually could. Like a tire had come off, and I just went, mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm, uh, here you go. I was like, but then he's like, oh, that's great. And like, I was like, oh, hail the conquering hero. Woo-hoo! And here's the thing we need to realize. Childlike faith means that sometimes you just have to say, God, I can't handle this. God, I need you to fix it. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the answer. I need you to fix it. Listen to this. People were bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. And this word for rebuked means devalued them. You ever had somebody devalue you? You ever devalue yourself? By the way, many of us are much kinder to other people than we are to ourselves. Sometimes you need to ask yourself the question, if somebody else was talking to one of my friends the way I just talked to myself, would I put up with it? Don't devalue yourself. I'm not saying that you can't admit what you do wrong and where you mess up, but don't devalue yourself. Why? Because you're valuable to God. He knows what you're worth. And then it continues. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. Why? For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What does that mean? God, I don't have my act together. God, I'm even not sure I even have my theology all right. I just trust in Jesus. I know that Jesus died and rose again. I know it's not about my work, so Lord, I surrender to you. So your final challenge, I want you to ask for the faith of a child. See, this little card's important to me. It's not important to anybody else. But it reminds me of the time we adopted Jenna when she was 10 years old. She's now 26. And just like all of our children, I say to her all the time, Honey, you are definitely my child because you drive me crazy sometimes. Right? That's the sign, right? But she's my child just as much as all the other children. And this reminds me of going across the world to say, I want you to be part of our family. And can I tell you something awesome about God? He would do the same for you. And he would do it again. You may feel like a failure. You may feel like you're messed up. You may feel like you're broken. And let me answer you. You are. But he absolutely loves you. So this Thanksgiving season, give thanks to God for what he's done for you. For that childlike faith. For healing you. For walking you through things. Don't compare yourself to other people thinking you're a little better than them. Instead, say, God, thank you that you love me broken, messed up me. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender to him. And if you need to do that today, I want to be here for you. I also want you to know if you're a Christian and the truth is you've been walking in all kind of struggles in these three stories, hey, it's okay. We all struggle. Make a new commitment today. And by the way, many of you are going to be tested in this commitment on Thursday. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for each one here. I do pray that we would know your love, acceptance. Lord, for that one who doesn't understand or know the value they have in you, that today they would know that they are your child. Lord, thank you for childlike faith. Remind us that it's not our works, it's not all the things that we do, but it's all that you have done. And we surrender and choose to surrender to you today. Thank you for these moments together, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.